good afternoon, uh, City of Tampa. Thank you so much for tuning in again. This isn't necessarily Facebook Live. We had a couple of technical difficulties that I promise were not my fault, although most technical difficulties are if I'm uh, operating anything. <laughs> but today is Earth Day, and this is the 50th celebration. So we're very, very excited. We have a wonderful guest, uh, my good friend, Wit, and we're gonna introduce him officially uh, very soon but uh, want to go over a couple of things first. Want to give you a case update. Uh, 979 total cases in Hillsborough County, including 20 deaths. Again, as I say every uh, afternoon, each of those uh, numbers represents an individual who is left behind uh, loved ones, friends, family, and neighbors. So any death is too many, but the fact that everyone is following the recommendations, safer at home order, is really uh, flattened that curve and has uh, resulted in saving a number of lives, as you saw or heard from my guest last night, Dr. Lockwood. So we're doing very well. According to Dr. Lockwood, we actually started on a downward trajectory in positive cases in uh, April 3rd, I believe he said. So that's a very, very positive sign. We said before 14 days, we have to be in it for 14 days with a reduction in cases to really be on the rebound. And we're at that with a caveat because we just started testing in large numbers uh, actually today. So we've really ramped up the testing. So that may or may not uh, change. Again, a large number of individuals may have this virus and be asymptomatic walking around having no idea that they have it. So not only are we looking at the ramping up of the test to see who has the virus, but also looking at those antibody testing to see uh, who's had the virus and is now immune to it. So very, very important. Uh, there are 27,869 total cases in the state of Florida with 867 uh, deaths. A quick update on one Tampa. We kicked off the small business portion of it yesterday and had a wonderful, wonderful day. The group was able to process, I believe it was 300 applications through. We intend to hopefully be able to help 800 businesses. You can go on to onetampa.org. You can type in the address of your business and it will let you know if you're in one of those low income census tracts or a CRA area. So please, please do that. We wanna make sure that we can get relief to as many uh, small businesses as we can. So very, very important. Um, the release today, I kind of teased yesterday, said that the two uh, steps that we can take to really minimize the uh, um, transmission of this virus and to avoid contracting it is to keep that six foot distance separation and to wear facial covering whenever you're in a position or in a place that you're not sure you can maintain that distance separation. And so we were very, very happy to announce uh, last week, I said that we had obtained enough cloth masks for our essential workers here in the city of Tampa. And then we were able to partner with uh, Public, CBS, Tampa General, Target, Walmart, Sam's Clubs, Home Depot, uh, Winn-Dixie, Moffitt Cancer Center, Advent Health, Tampa Electric, and Tico People's Gas, and Walgreens. Each of those uh, companies are requiring their team members to wear facial covering whenever they're in contact with the public. So that is wonderful to see. I said that my goal was to uh, have my phone blow up with individuals when they saw that list, organizations wanting to know why they weren't on it. So we really want to, to get as many people as we possibly can wearing facial coverings whenever you may come in contact with other individuals. Just have to let common sense be your guide. If you're out walking your dog or you're jogging or something like that, clearly you don't have to wear a face mask. Just when you're in places like uh, the grocery store, the pharmacy, uh, hardware stores, those types of, of incidents where you can't avoid coming in contact with individuals. So again, thank you so much to everyone who is abiding by the safer at home. Um, if we take those steps you know, to, to test, to see who has the antibodies and to wear the facial coverings, we can open up much, much quicker. So I, I believe that it's a very important step 
and opening our, our city and our county and the entire Tampa Bay area up uh, more quickly and to do it safely. As I have said many times, I don't see the safe, safety and well-being of our community uh, being in an, an adversarial position with opening up the economy. I believe that we can do them both at the same time if we do it thoughtfully. So very, very uh, important. Don't forget, we got our dance party. I know Wit does it every night. I have no doubt about it. Every night, six o'clock, there you go. We got our iHeart radio stations at 93.3 FLZ, Mix 100.7, 95.7 The Beat, Roomba 106.5, 98 Rock, and US 103.5. Tune in to any of those stations, six o'clock at night, and you will be able to uh, see your neighbors outside and you'll be able to have a big old block party, dance party, as long as you're six foot uh, away from each other. Very, very important. So last night they tell me the song is Thunderstruck and I said, well, maybe I'm so old, I don't know what that song is. And they said, it's the lightning song. I said, oh, I thought that was called the lightning song. So we hereby renamed Thunderstruck as the lightning song, which it should have been all along in my personal opinion. Uh, as I discussed last night with doc, um, the show with Dr. Lockwood, uh, USF is starting the USF Health Medical Matters, and that started this morning. Um, the Tampa Bay community, they're going to keep them informed on matters related to COVID-19, and you'll be able to see that, see that program on uh, Instagram at City of Tampa. And it is, I believe it's every Monday, Monday and Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Very, very important. So make sure that you tune in. If you missed it this morning, then you missed Dr. Lockwood, who is nothing short of fascinating um, every time I have a conversation with him. So very important, if you wanna stay up on COVID through the health professionals, please tune in at City of Tampa, 10 o'clock, Mondays and Wednesdays. Monday's guest is gonna be virologist, Dr. Michael Tang. And, um, I'm sure that that will be very interesting as well. So let's get to the, today's guest, Whit, Whit Reamer. Um, he is president of Walk Bike Tampa Bay, or Walk Bike Tampa. In his professional life, Whit works to make communities safer and more resilient to natural disasters. I find your job fascinating. His company, IBHS, has a world-class research chamber that can simulate hurricanes, hailstorms, and wildfires. Witt holds a master's in urban and regional planning from the University of New Orleans, Nolens, a law degree from Loyola College of Law, and a bachelor's degree from Florida State University. So clearly, yes, there you go. Clearly, he is a slacker. We'll have to get past that. But uh, incredible resume and just an all-around wonderful person. I've known Witt for, a, for a, a long time, mostly in our, our work around making cycling safe in our community. But uh, very excited to have you here on our show today. And I will start off uh, with a question about your uh, current job. And, um, you know, most people have no idea that we have a world-class research organization that focuses on making homes stronger in these uh, natural disasters, uh, threats that, that we see not only here in Florida, but in states across the nation. So can you tell us a little bit more about your company and exactly what you do? Sure, well, thanks for having me on, Mayor Caster. And, and um, my family uh, truly appreciates the leadership that you've shown uh, through the, the crisis that uh, we're going through right now. Um, so, so thank you and your team for that. Uh, so yeah, so um, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety has a, has a small office on the campus of Mosey right here in the city of Tampa. And that uh, research chamber that you referenced is, is located up in rural South Carolina. And it's, um, it's, it's one of a kind and it's world class because we're the only place that can actually build a, a full size house um, inside of a, a wind tunnel and uh, subject it to uh, lots of different elements. So we have uh, hail cannons that we can shoot at the, the glass and the roof and we can, we can put cars in there. Uh, we can simulate category three hurricanes and, and wildfires. Uh, and what we do is we take the lessons of 
how well built or how poorly constructed a house is and the materials that go into that house. And we give those lessons to uh, the general public, to contractors, to insurance companies. And we try to help people make more informed decisions uh, when it comes to, to building their house because we know that um, wildfires and, and uh, wind storms are, are, are becoming more frequent and more intense. And we know that we're not gonna be able to entirely prevent kind of the worst damage that those hazards cause. Mm -hmm. But we think there's a lot of work around the edges of those storms and those hazards that can be mitigated or, or prevented. Uh, and simple things like um, impact resistant windows and making sure you get a, a strong roof over your head out west, kind of keeping the debris away from the edge of your house can really help reduce the ember buildup during a wildfire. So really simple steps homeowners can take and builders can take uh, without um, really going over budget that can help reduce these disasters. And um, so we, we do uh, a lot of work um, with the insurance companies and uh, try, try to help everybody really from the mortgage holder to the homeowner um, and, and businesses with their continuity plans um, uh, have a safer structure to, to live in. Uh, so that, it's really exciting work. Yeah, that's got to be exciting work. I can't imagine how many houses have been built there. But, you know, you look at um, it, it may cost more in the construction if you're using the materials that are wind resistant, hail resistant, fire retardant. But, um, you know, do the insurance companies and the contractors, is there any kind of communication or relationship there where the contractors can can utilize something that may cost more to build that particular house, but then the insurance will be lower as a result. So they can factor that into the construction product and convince the buyer to go with those, those elements. Well, that's certainly um, something that folks can ask their insurance companies about. Uh, here in Florida, we have a a mandatory wind mitigation credit if your roof is shaped, uh, shaped a certain way uh, or if it was built after the Florida Building Code was enacted, uh, uh, the new Florida Building Code was enacted after Hurricane Andrew. So there are certainly conversations that people can have um, to do that. You know, you know, choosing between a granite countertop and uh, a, a stronger shingle, you know, that's a tough choice. And so uh, giving homeowners the information and, and finding those places, those, those levers to help folks make the right decision and finding offsets, whether it's through tax credits or rebates, things like that. There's a whole plethora of, of funding um, opportunities yeah. that, that homeowners and builders can look to to, to help make their mm -hmm. homes stronger. Yeah, it is. It's, that's very interesting you say that. You know, it's so much uh, more rewarding to have people come in and look at your kitchen remodeled then everybody get on a ladder and go up and see that you just put on a, a new roof. So um, very, very interesting. So can you tell us a little bit about, since today is Earth Day, a little bit about the history of Earth Day? Sure, so, and happy Earth Day to, to you and the city. And we planted else. a tree today. Uh, it is the 50th anniversary. I'm sure that's not how many of the large event organizers, uh, uh, this isn't exactly what they had planned to do virtual Earth Day events, but alas, here we are. Um, you know, Earth Day being 50 years old, it puts us back to 1970, and that was really the beginning of the environmental movement here in the United States. Um, there were a couple of key environmental um, catastrophes, for lack of a better word, that really uh, woke people up to the, to the problems with pollution in their air and, and their water. Uh, there was an oil spill off the uh, coast of Santa Barbara, and then the Cuyahoga River in Ohio literally caught on fire. Uh, and this, this really sparked this, this movement of uh, young people at the time, but, but, but certainly over the last 50 years has, has grown to, to capture um, demographics of all sorts. But, um, you know, Earth Day back in, in, in the 1970s sparked uh, several new pieces of federal legislation, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Wilderness Act of 1969. These were all really major environmental laws that were passed that have that have saved millions of lives. Um, and honestly, no uh, major pieces of environmental legislation as big as these have been passed uh, in the last 50 years. And so there's a lot of work ahead of us. Um, 
but Earth Day is a, is a good time to, to remember those important pieces of, of federal legislation and, and some of this legislation that followed. Um, but you know, every day is an Earth Day. Uh, we really yeah, need to be. take care of, of our neighbors, our, our air and our water every day, but, but it is good to, to mark it here on, um, on April 22nd, which I'm told the history behind that has to do with, with that young movement uh, it kind of fell between spring break and exams. And uh, so. Oh. oh, that's good. Yeah, it's nice to see so many young kids on spring break going and doing uh, volunteer work rather than hanging out at at, uh, at the beaches. But um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, some stories like COVID-19. So today being Earth Day, and I actually saw uh, before COVID-19 made its way to our country, I saw a, a map of China prior to COVID-19 and it, in essence, a heat map and it was covered in dark orange. And then after they had gone to their stay at home order for a long period of time, they showed a side by side comparison and, and the entire what was pollution was all gone. So what kind of an effect has COVID-19 had on, on our environment here in, in our nation? Sure. Well, there have been there have been a lot of kind of uh, headline capturing stories about how how COVID nineteen has affected the environment. Um, there was one with uh, some videos of, of canals in uh, Venice, Italy, with uh, dolphins swimming. Them. It actually wasn't in Venice; that was, <laughs> was in another part of Italy. But, but what that showed was, you know, the the water quality there actually hadn't improved that much. But it was the sedimentation at the bottom of the canals that it kind of settled with all the boats not going back and forth. The air pollution is the one that we have really seen um, a remarkable, tangible drop in both carbon dioxide and nitrogen dioxide uh, pollution. And, and that's mainly because people aren't driving around, factories maybe have reduced their, their output. Um, and what's remarkable about this is the short amount of time that we've seen that these major improvements yeah. in air quality have been achieved. I mean, really, uh, we're told that there are, there are populations near the Himalayan mountains that haven't seen um, uh, the, the, the top of the mountain in, in decades, and now they're, 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 they're clear views. I mean, you can see the smog in China, as you referenced, has been significantly decreased. But I think what this does, at least for me, and hopefully for people, is captures the imagination about how when we come together and and, and unfortunately this this COVID-19 has been a, a bad catalyst for, for seeing this, but with with um, the right types of um, policies, I think we can really impact uh, positively um, environmental change um, in a very short amount of time. So it's, it's very encouraging to, 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 to see some of that. Yeah, it sure is. It's, um, it is amazing to see that. And so very encouraging to, uh, you know, to, to make sure that we follow through on that once we're out from under this COVID-19. So it's also the 10th anniversary, the week of the 10th anniversary of the BP oil spill. spill. Where, did you play a part? Not the spill part, but the, uh, the recovery from that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I remember uh, clearly 10 years ago when the BP oil spill, when um, the Deepwater Horizon oil um, uh, drilling rig collapsed, it, it fell on the same week as Earth Day, and that, that was um, yes. uh, its yeah. own. Ironic. Uh, right. So, so, yeah, I mean, the short answer is I was living in New Orleans. I could actually smell uh, the oil um, burning when, when I lived in New Orleans. And um, shortly thereafter, I actually moved to DC and worked at the Environmental Protection Agency uh, and, and had a front row seat to seeing the response effort to that. Uh, several years later, I ended up helping uh, work with an environmental organization, right, the Restore Act, which became the piece of legislation, probably the biggest piece of environmental legislation since the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, um, that helped fund the environmental and economic restoration of the BP oil spill. And um, I know the city of Tampa uh, received some funds uh, yeah. from that settlement agreement uh, and, and were able to restore and uh, some green space. Uh -huh. And that's a great use of those funds. Um, so, you know, it, we do need to look back and, and think about uh, the impacts of, of relying on those um, those fossil fuels from the Gulf of Mexico have and, and really make sure we're, we're, we're safe uh, when we're, we're drilling so close to our, our beaches and, and somewhere with just such 
precious and incredible wildlife that we find in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Yes, no doubt. And it's, uh, it's incredible. I mean, even you look here locally, uh, we had the uh, Bee Free Bay initiative and just seeing how many of those toxic beads were underneath the water and, and how much of a, a part uh, the water plays in our day-to-day -day lives and, and the need for us to ensure we take every step to keep it clean. So let's move on to the roadway. So you uh, had the Walk Bike Tampa. So let's talk about complete streets and, and maybe this is a, a wonderful time for us to look at trying to encourage individuals to use alternate modes of transportation, you know, bicycles, pedestrians, walking, um, looking at the safety of our streets. We have a incredibly reduced amount of traffic out on our roadways, but what we found is that that just causes people to drive a lot faster all yeah. over the city. But uh, what do you have if, if any thoughts about that, how we can encourage individuals that when they are coming back out, going back to work, going about their business, that they focus on the environment and focus on alternate modes of transportation in our city. Sure. Well, putting on my uh, walk bike Tampa hat, sure. Uh, well, first off, your administration has, has done an incredible job prioritizing uh, Vision Zero, I know it's on the top of your list uh, uh, over in the transportation um, department. So, so th thanks for your work on that. Uh, Walk Bike Tampa is a, is a local nonprofit uh, pedestrian and bike advocacy organization. And we, we, we're trying to essentially make our, our streets safer for everybody. You know, um, auto automobile uh, drivers, uh, no one wants to hit a pedestrian or get in an accident with a, with a biker. Um, so really the idea of Vision Zero is, is making sure all modes of transportation are safe and protected. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, we have seen a, a lot less congestion, a lot less traffic from the automobile side during COVID-19, and that's gotten a lot more people out walking and biking. You've seen this on um, Bayshore in particular, but you're really seeing it across uh, every neighborhood in Tampa. Uh, and you're seeing more kids on the street riding their bikes. You're seeing more families walking together but people still have to drive to go to the grocery store. And so that friction between uh, a dangerous automobile and, and uh, people walking and biking is a, is a real problem. Um, there are lots of things that other cities have explored. I know you, your administration actually explored closing some streets to vehicular traffic and allowing more people to come out. And you know there was kind of a, you know really some questions about whether that was the right thing to do given the public health crisis. And, and I think that after all this settles, that hopefully some opportunities will open up to explore those open street ideas where you can allow people to come out for the day and, and just walk and bike safely. Um, in terms of complete streets, uh, you know, that's a, a street that has uh, hopefully protected bike lanes, um, narrower lanes to help slow down automobiles. Um, there's a lot we can do on existing streets and certainly as we re-envision major thoroughfares. Uh, I think there's a lot of really great out ideas out there about mm -hmm. how, to, how to make all these things work together so we can provide alternative modes of transportation for those folks that, that want or have to bike to work um, mm -hmm. and, and families that are maybe going to continue this uh, nightly walk that they've gotten accustomed to the last six weeks. I think it's been really great, at least in, in my neighborhood, to see folks that I've never seen out walking before. Mm -hmm. um, out there. Unfortunately, a lot of them are in the middle of the street because there's not sidewalks, but we'll work on that too. Right. Yeah, we'll, we're going to be working on all of it without a doubt. And it is so nice to see, uh, you know, it's like it's it's a sense of community, people out walking and biking, really saying hello to your neighbors. But uh, those are very important points. The open streets is something that I've participated in the past uh, here in Tampa and intend to continue that once we're through this virus. And then the complete streets, you know, we've, we've got a, a very um, focused effort on that throughout our community and making our streets, doing everything that we can to make our, our streets uh, safe for everyone, the motoring, biking, and walking public. But talking about how our environment is so much cleaner, our air is so much cleaner uh, because of the, the reduction in the, the uh, vehicular traffic, um, you know, to 
to be able to continue with that focus as well and looking at solutions for mass transit. You know, being able to get individuals out there in um, uh, buses that are electric, uh, looking at the streetcar, ways that you can move large groups of individuals and not have to have everyone in their own vehicle driving back and forth. So we're focused on that. The only thing that that we lack there is the funding. And, and I was very hopeful that the all for transportation funding would come through. If it doesn't, then we will, you know, if nothing else, I'm persistent. So we will continue to look for the funding to make sure that, um, that we can do everything that we can to provide uh, transportation alternatives. So sustainability and resiliency are one of my five main areas of, of focus. And um, <clears throat> I know that you've worked with a number of different cities on sustainability uh, plans and policies. What should we be? What are some ideas that you have for us in that area here in the well, city? I think you've, you've started off uh, already committing to some really solid goals. I think you've, you've committed to help reducing the city's own uh, carbon footprint. Um, and I, I think up to 50% by, by 2030 or something like that. And, uh, and that's remarkable. And uh, there's a lot of things that I think this, some really low hanging fruit the city can do to achieve that. And then there's gonna be some tougher ones, retrofitting buildings, making sure that the uh, vehicle fleet isn't, um, isn't producing uh, um, more carbon than it, than it has to, looking at electric vehicles and things like that. Uh, you know, the Resilient Cities Catalyst is another great opportunity for the city of Tampa oh, yeah. to get some um, uh, partnership opportunities. I mean, I, I love when, when you first uh, announced um, today, this, this partnership with all these local businesses, really that public-private partnership is such an important role for cities to help uh, lean on and lean in on their, their industries. I mean, Tico is a, is a really important player in the city, and I think there's a lot that Tico can uh, add to this effort. But really focusing on, on stormwater issues, on making sure that any plans or projects that the city undertakes are equitable and, and making sure that every neighborhood gets uh, uh, the benefits of, of all these things that we know are, are healthier for our community, whether it be solar farms um, on vacant city property or, or providing those uh, mass transportation solutions, uh, which help reduce the overall carbon footprint. You know, we're, we also can't deny that we're on a peninsula here uh, on a coast and there are going to be choices that have to be made when it comes to sea level rise and, um, and, and there, there are long term solutions and then there are things that we can start to look at by, um, you know, making sure that we've got mangroves that can help reduce storm attenuation when, when big uh, hurricanes roll through. So looking for those living shorelines, those nature based solutions. There's just a whole plethora of opportunities. And the great thing about so many of these solutions are there are co-benefits. I mean, when you plant trees along your coast to help reduce storm uh, and the impacts of waves, you get that benefit of having green space along your coast. And it really adds up in terms of making a beautiful place to work, live, and play here in Tampa. Yes, without a doubt. And then also a lot of people, when you talk about sustainability and resiliency, they automatically go to the environment and really sustainability and resiliency applies to our neighborhoods as well. And as you said, ensuring that, you know, we're, we're paying attention to the entire city and, you know, not just particular uh, areas. So it's a very, very exciting area and it's something that I'm excited about.